Looking healthy. All right, we are totally live. Let folks in. We're off to the races. Welcome, everyone. We will get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna give folks just a few seconds to, uh, to make their way in from the waiting room and we'll get started shortly. Kathleen, I'm ready whenever you are. Fabulous. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Advancing Equitable Recycling Reform with Extended Producer Responsibility. Product packaging, including plastic, cardboard, glass, and metal makes up about 30 to 40% of the materials entering our municipal waste programs. And managing those materials isn't cheap. Maine municipalities spend about $17 million managing packaging materials every year. Improving that system and making those manufacturers, not Maine taxpayers, responsible for the cost of recycling materials is a top priority of Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition. We are thrilled to have the bill's sponsor, State Rep Nicole Grahowski, with us today. She is joined by Sarah Nichols, the Sustainable Maine Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Welcome. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. We'll hear from our speakers and then tackle questions for both of them in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait. If you have questions, you can send them to me, Kathleen, through the chat whenever they occur to you. Uh, you can find that chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. I'll keep track of the questions to ask during the Q&A at the end. If you have any technical difficulties, you can message Will Sedlak through the chat and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learn programs. Thanks again for joining us. And Sarah, I will let you kick things off. I think you, Kathleen. Just bear with me one moment while I get my screen share up here. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, I was gonna say good morning, but I think it's good afternoon now. Um, thank you, Will and Kathleen uh, and MCV for hosting the Lunch and Learn. I am really, really excited. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah Nichols. I'm NRCM Sustainable Maine Director. And for those of you who don't know, NRCM, uh, we're one of the state's largest environmental advocacy organizations have been, and we've been protecting Maine's environment for over 60 years. 
We have a staff of almost 30 people. We work across a wide range of environmental policies and I am our resident trash talker. I head up our sustainable Maine program and I work on all of the waste related policies for um, uh, state and local policies. And I've been working there for about seven years now. Um, and I'm just really, really excited to talk to you about our ongoing initiative to reform recycling in Maine by passing an extended producer responsibility for packaging law or what we're calling an EPR for packaging law. Um, this really creates a more sustainable, effective, and equitable way for us to manage our waste and by shifting the costs from municipalities and property taxpayers to the big corporations who are making all of this packaging waste. And joining me is State Representative Nicole Grahowski. I'm, uh, she's been such a champion um, of this issue um, for years. Uh, you know, in 2019, we passed a, a resolution um, unanimously through uh, the legislature signed by the governor that would directed the uh, Department of Environmental Protection to draft this legislation um, for an EPR for packaging program. That turned into um, LD2104 last year and uh, Representative Grahowski was um, a great advocate of that as well. Um, unfortunately, COVID uh, shut down the legislature um, abruptly and um, that bill and many others kind of died along with that. And um, now she is sponsoring um, the new bill um, and we're really excited to, to dive into that today. So I'm gonna hand it off to Representative uh, Grahowski now. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for the intro, and thank you um, for hosting this event, uh, Maine Conservation Voters, and also the Environmental Priorities Coalition for um, calling this out as a big priority bill this session. I am so excited to be working on this effort with NRCM, DEP, and so many other stakeholders. Uh, I have, too, been a trash talker for many, many years of my life, um, going back to uh, picking up trash on the side of the road with my parents when I was a kiddo and volunteering at our recycling center in Ellsworth um, as a Girl Scout. So fixing recycling is very important to me, but it is also a top issue in my district. And now that people know that I'm working on a reform for recycling, they're asking me all the time, when are we going to save recycling? Everybody wants to know that those products um, the packaging that is around the products that they're purchasing is going somewhere meaningful and not just to landfill or to incineration. So I will um, start today's presentation by describing Maine's current waste and recycling challenges, which are important to understand in order to identify why extended producer responsibility for packaging is the solution that we need to get us out of this mess. Uh, and then Sarah will take us through a deep look into the policy details, the who, what, when, where, why, how it all works. And of course, we will take questions at the end. And as Kathleen pointed out, you can pop them in the chat whenever you like, and we will get to them later on. So I hope that this presentation sparks your curiosity, excitement about this needed reform, because we will need all hands on deck to pass this policy this session. So right now we are making more trash than we recycle and the amount of trash we are making is going up. Our state has had a goal of recycling 50% of our waste since 1989, but we have never reached that goal. In fact, we're going backwards and our recycling rate is estimated to be more like 36%, though we do not really have robust and accurate data to be certain about that. Meanwhile, our per capita waste disposal rate is increasing. So we are actually going in the opposite direction of the state goal on that front. So it's clear that business as usual, taxpayer funded model of recycling and disposal is just not working and we need a reform. But before we discuss that reform, I do wanna take a step back for a moment to think about why are we doing this work? <clears throat> why? is it that more waste means more problems? And these problems are severe and they are urgent. So one of the reasons uh, is about disposal. Um, any materials that we don't reduce, reuse, or recycle are landfilled, incinerated, or end up in our environment as litter. We need to significantly scale back how much we are filling our landfills because they do lead to pollution and most people don't want a landfill in their town or backyard. Uh, incineration does help reduce the volume of material that we landfill, but the environmental trade-off is in air emissions. And regarding litter, it's estimated that there are 150 million metric tons of plastic in the marine environment already. 
Every year we add about 8 million more. And at this rate, you might've heard, we will have more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. Uh, another reason that, that focusing on recycling is important is that we can be smarter about our resources. Uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling does conserve resources. For example, recycling one ton of aluminum saves 39.6 barrels of oil. Recycling one ton of paper saves 17 trees, 380 gallons of oil, 4,000 kilowatts of energy, and 7,000 gallons of water. So uh, making new materials is definitely resource intensive as compared to recycling. Climate facts. It is estimated that greenhouse gas emissions from the full life cycle material management activities account for 55 to 65% of greenhouse gas emissions in the developed countries like the United States. So the production and incineration of plastic alone produces emissions equal to that of 189 500 megawatt coal power plants. So if we could uh, stop producing and incinerating as much plastic, we could really make a dent in our emissions. Uh, here in Maine, reaching our 50% recycling goal would be the same as taking 166,000 passenger cars off the road every year. And finally, it's important to think about this in terms of environmental justice. We all bear some of the consequences of uh, this waste and materials, but there are people who suffer a disproportionate health burden from the climate effects and the toxic pollution created by making and disposing of waste. These communities are typically lower income or minority communities located downwind or downstream to plastics manufacturers, industrial farms, landfills, incinerators, or other polluting facilities. It is definitely an undeniable and well-documented environmental justice issue around the world and here in the US. And that's why I think it's important for us to act in Maine to do our part to diminish those consequences. So the legislation we'll present today uh, targets packaging waste because it makes up about 40% of our waste stream here in Maine. And much of it is not designed with recycling in mind. The type of packaging we have is changing all the time without regard for whether or not there is a recycling bin or a market for that material. And when I say packaging, what I mean is things like cereal boxes, Amazon, Amazon packaging, yogurt tubs, takeout containers, juice boxes, flexible pouches, all those things that en encapsulate the item that you want inside and these things that end up in our homes. So we like to think about, uh, we don't like to think about, but it's a reality that there is sort of a tsunami of trash and packaging materials that is engulfing us. And it is leading to more plastic pollution and costing taxpayers a lot of money as cities and towns try to deal with this new waste. It is causing an unnecessary strain on already struggling municipalities, their budgets, and it's also harming our environment and our health. So I would argue this packaging waste problem is not gonna get any better without meaningful changes in policy. This slide actually is a photo from uh, the town of Trenton, which is uh, this other community I represent in addition to Ellsworth, which unfortunately closed its recycling center. And this is not an uncommon site around Maine. So after waste reduction and reuse, recycling is our best strategy to address the environmental and health problems associated with our packaging waste problems. A big part of this policy is to save taxpayers money and bring much needed support to municipalities who are struggling to pay for and manage our recycling programs. We found out that Maine property taxpayers currently pay 16 to 17 and a half million dollars per year to manage packaging waste, either through recycling or disposal. And recent DEP reports, our Department of Environmental Protection, find it costs an average of 60% more to recycle than to dispose of waste. So what happens is cities and towns are put in a difficult situation. They have to decide, do they wanna raise taxes or cut recycling programs? And we do not believe that the answer lies in throwing more taxpayer dollars at this problem, but rather shifting these costs to the producers of waste. So people in Maine are generally pretty frustrated by this situation. They feel like they can't avoid wasteful packaging because they want the product. And the recycling instructions are either non-existent or inaccurate, uh, or they go to recycle something and they find that they can't recycle it in their town because their town can no longer afford to offer that program. So it's really hard when companies or we in government ask people to do our part, you know, do your part, recycle more. Uh, well, if it were easy 
to reduce, reuse, and recycle, then more people would. I really believe that. So if the packaging I get is easily recyclable, I can go just down the road, or maybe there's curbside pickup, I'm going to do that because it saves me money to not throw things out. And I feel like it's the right thing to do. But if there's not an option, then we just can't move forward. So we do need a better system to make it easier for people to participate. So we're excited to talk about a new way forward because the status quo, as I hope you agree, is just not working. Um, there is too much packaging, not enough of it is recyclable, and it is costing municipalities too much money. So we need to reduce packaging and have it be more recyclable. And that is what extended producer responsibility for packaging uh, legislation would do. We call it recycling reform because it is a change in the system and the way we approach and think about our waste problem. Setting this new system in place will help us get the tools and the data that we need to make even more needed policy changes. So EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, uh, is a type of policy that makes the producer of a product or package responsible in some way for the end of life management. It's really what we call a polluter pays principle. Right now, producers are not doing enough to help communities make recycling more effective. Part of the reason is because they are not the ones responsible for cleaning up the mess that is created by their businesses. And they don't currently internalize any of those costs. Rather, they externalize them onto us, our municipalities and us as taxpayers. And we have little to no control over what packaging is uh, surrounding the products that we're interested in. So by applying the polluter pays principle to packaging, Maine can bring relief to our cities and towns, give them the resources they need to improve the long-term effectiveness of their recycling programs. EPR also provides the right incentives for producers to reduce their packaging waste or design it to be recycled because they are now responsible for helping to clean it up. Now, this might seem like a newfangled idea, but in Maine, we do have eight EPR laws for other types of problem waste, uh, including paint, beverage containers, that's our bottle bill that you're probably familiar with, e-waste and mercury containing products, for example. And there are dozens of other states with over hundred EPR laws in the US. But EPR for packaging in particular has not yet come to the United States. So we are actually an outlier uh, and Maine, excitingly, I think, is one of 11 states who are now pursuing this exciting policy reform. Big corporations already pay for recycling programs in over 40 countries and five provinces in Canada. Um, some of those programs have been in place for more than 30 years, so we know that they're effective. <clears throat> in places with EPR for packaging, um, recycling rates are often around double up to Maine's rate because the producers have that direct economic incentive to produce less wasteful packaging that can easily and profitably be managed by municipal recycling programs. And because there is a sustainable source of funding for recycling collection, processing, and education. It's also interesting that those EPR programs have the same per capita costs as our taxpayer funded system but they are twice as effective. So uh, you get more bang for your buck with EPR just by shifting these costs from property taxpayers to the producers of waste who can internalize the costs. So when I say producers, you might be wondering who exactly are these producers? Well, they are the brand owners. They're basically the company who decides to put the package on the product that you want. There are at least 500 wealthy brand owners who do business in Maine that already pay for Canada's recycling programs through their EPR for packaging laws. We believe that if they can do this everywhere else in the world, then they can do it here too. It is worth noting that many of these companies have aggressive waste reduction, reuse and recycling goals, but they might not be likely to reach those without these sort of changes in policy and the EPR system in place for packaging. Uh, one of those reasons is that this policy will level the playing field so that producers who have those aggressive goals and are doing the right things would no longer be putting themselves at a financial disadvantage compared to producers who are just interested in the cheapest packaging possible. Uh, and speaking of packaging, um, I know we already told you that we're focusing on packaging, but to put a finer point on what we mean by packaging, we mean the packaging that is managed by Maine's municipalities in their waste stream. We're not talking about packaging that's business to business or you know, back of the house or things that are sold out of state. 
Um, but there's even more exciting details. And so I want to turn it over to Sarah now to talk about some of the uh, specifics of our legislation. And um, she has really been working with so, so many other groups to, to work out the fine details. And I know she'll be excited to share them with you. So go ahead, Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Representative. That was a great um, setup. I'm even more fired up after listening to you. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, describe all the fun details of this policy. I guess I'm one of those nerdy policy wonks. So forgive me um, in advance uh, for, for the level of detail. Um, so right now, every, well, first, everybody's always curious how we make this transition from a property taxpayer funded system to a producer funded system. So, you know, right now municipalities raise property taxes and they pay for all of the costs associated with recycling and disposal of packaging. And with an EPR law, there is a new stewardship organization that's formed. Our um, main DEP would be selecting the stewardship organization and they would have representation from all uh, stakeholders in the waste, uh, in the waste stream. It would be producers, haulers, recyclers, municipalities, environmental organizations would have rep representation on this um, organization. Their primary function is to collect fees from the, the producers that are based on the, the weight and type of packaging that they're making. And then they reimburse municipalities for um, all of the costs of uh, recycling and managing the packaging waste. Um, they have other functions as well, which are uh, to assist producers in um, calculating their fees and helping them reduce their fees and same for municipalities helping them set up uh, the systems, the efficient systems that we need um, to make uh, reach our goals in this, in this policy. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the fees, what the fees are based on and how they're collected. So annually, um, the fees are set um, in a way that are, are based by material and those fees must cover the actual cost of managing that particular material. So it has to cover the collection, processing, transportation, all the disposal, recycling fees, um, education, infrastructure, and, and, uh, and education for that particular material, and um, the producer share of administrative costs. So there won't be nickel and diming for additional costs. It's just it's just fees that that support the whole stewardship organization. And then this is where the magic happens. We uh, there will be eco-modulated adjustments to the fees that must incentivize packaging reduction, uh, reuse of packaging, lower toxicity in packaging, uh, more recycled content in the packaging to support the markets, uh, more readily recyclable packaging. That means more uh, readily recyclable means that there is a strong market for that package. Um, and litter reduction and accurate recycling instructions for consumers on the package will help reduce the cost to producers. We just wanna put all the right economic incentives in place to get the desired results that we want. Okay, and with any good EPR law, it's really important that there are not a lot of um, exempted producers. When there's an exempted producer, it doesn't actually exempt the material that they're creating. It just, that's all still gonna be there. It'll just be paid for and managed by the other producers who are participating. So it's really not fair to exempt uh, a lot of producers or a producer who's making a lot and lot of, of packaging waste. However, we do need to make it, um, we need to protect our smaller businesses and our businesses who are not actually contributing much to the problem. So the policy will have a small producer exemption that mirrors a lot of what's happening in Canada already. So any uh, producer who uh, earns more than $2 million a year in gross revenue would be exempted from the program or if there's a producer that generates less than one ton of packaging per year, you're exempted. And there's calculators and assistance by the stewardship organization to help uh, businesses figure out if they're in or out for the packaging. Another way to be exempted is if more than 50% of your gross revenue is from the sale of goods acquired through salvages, liquidations, et cetera. Um, think of a Martins, for instance, where it's really hard to source where this material is coming from and how to attribute that to the producers um, they would not have to participate. And also the definition of producer excludes nonprofits. <clears throat> then there's another tier of producers that have a certain level of, um, I guess, uh, protection um, and some certainty here in how the law will impact them. So these are producers that generate between one and 15 tons of packaging per year. 
they would have the choice to either pay the, the uh, fees that I just talked about that the large producers would be paying, or they could choose to just pay a one, one and done flat fee for the year. And um, we're seeing in other places that if producers do decide to go um, the flat fee route, they're probably gonna be paying more than if they did all the, the reporting necessary to do the, the regular fees, but that would be their choice. Um, and if they have the, the staff and the wherewithal to do that. And um, to help provide some certainty to these businesses, the law will um, cap the, the flat fees such that no uh, business would be paying um, in this in this low volume producer category would be paying more than 7,500 for the year um, or more than $500 per ton. So those would be set at a tiered basis. And this is really reflective of um, kind of the, the, the highest amount of fees that we're seeing in Canada right now. And ideally those will go down over time, but this is just a cap. Um, for those producers who are not exempted. So anybody making over $2 million a year and more than one ton of packaging may be subject to these fees. Okay, so now we know how the fees are collected and uh, now we're gonna talk about how those get reimbursed, municipalities get reimbursed for their costs. These are costs that they've already made and they're just getting reimbursed. So first of all, it's important to note that it's voluntary for municipalities to participate. I have no idea why a municipality would choose to continue paying for all of this by themselves, but they would have the option to do that. Um, and it's important that municipalities can join in groups. Right now, municipalities tend to um, partner um, with the managing waste and transfer stations, or maybe you're a member of EcoMain, you could have EcoMain kind of uh, join on behalf of your municipality. It gives a flexibility to choose how you might participate in that. Um, the one catch for municipalities is that they would have to collect all of the readily recyclable material that the DEP puts on a list each year. And that's really tied to the markets. Um, so let's say it might be plastics one and two, paper, metals, cardboard. Um, uh, if you're going to participate, you have to at least collect a minimum of those items. And that's really to help get a little bit more streamlined. Um, and uh, easier for a statewide education on recycling if at least a certain chunk of materials are collected in every single town, which is a, a far cry from where we are right now. Um, and every year municipalities would get reimbursed um, on a median per ton uh, average cost for similar municipalities. So basically what that means is, uh, this is the efficiency factor for, um, for payments. In some jurisdictions, they may have, uh, municipalities still have some skin in the game by paying for half or 20% of the overall program so that they really have an incentive to run a lean and mean program. Um, in Maine, we've decided to follow the lead of Quebec uh, where they, they reimburse municipalities for average costs. So let's say if you're one who, run, who does run a lean and mean program, you might actually get uh, paid a little, back a little bit more than what you actually spent. But if you're a municipality who uh, has a less efficient program and you've decided to give your brother-in-law really um, huge hauling contract, knowing you're going to get reimbursed, then you're going to have to actually pay for that because that's uh, that's not fair to the participating producers. Also in the law, we have uh, per capita reimbursement pays, or, or just payments rather for uh, to offset the cost of packaging disposal. Right now, there's so much packaging that is not recyclable and um, disposal is expensive. And that's not fair that our municipalities and taxpayers have to pay for that um, either. Okay. So it's no wonder why Maine's municipalities love recycling reform. Um, you can see this list here are all of the municipalities who have taken the steps to adopt a municipal resolution in support of EPR for packaging um, because they recognize that what they're doing, it's, it's not fair, they want help, they need money, they wanna provide these services to their, their uh, residents and um, this is the way that, that they can do that. Um, if you don't see your town on this list and you'd like to, uh, please let me know and um, we will help uh, get your town up to speed and um, talk to your local decision makers. It's really important that representatives from these towns talk to your uh, lawmakers in Augusta to, to let them know the types of issues that you're facing in, in your town and how this policy um, will help. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I get asked a lot. All right, so you're saying this works, you know, like, or, or how does this actually lead to um, to increase recycling and all the, the desired outcomes that we want um, with less waste. And I think there's three big reasons for that. And the first one is Nicole mentioned is that it internalizes recycling costs. Um, 
you know, this might be the difference between even having a recycling program in your town and not. If a town can't afford to have one, then they're not going to have a recycling program and they're not going to be able to get those high recycling rates. Um, I, I, I think of it as a, a insurance policy for recycling programs when the markets shift. You know, towns won't be abruptly um, faced with an increased cost that they, they can't afford. It's not in their budget and have to, uh, you know, abandon or reduce what they take in their recycling programs, which is exactly what's happening here. And that's not happening in Canada, in these provinces that have it, let's say. Another good example of cost internalization that I, I like to use is, um, or you know, the, the theory behind it is, I like to use my, my kids. So they're messy um, and they make big messes all over my house. And as soon as they got old enough, um, I've had, I had them start cleaning up their own messes. And lo and behold, there's less mess in the first place when they know that they're the ones that are responsible for, for picking it up. Um, it's very basic, even, uh, even children uh, respond well to that kind of incentive. And next, it really targets packaging design. Um, and um, even just by, by the, the weight, the more packaging you, you make, the more you're gonna have to pay to do it. We really want less, less packaging um, in our waste stream. Um, and it targets that in a way where we want more materials to be having a market, uh, playing a role in our circular economy, and um, the fee structure really, really gets at that part. Um, and next, this really increases um, access and ease of participating in recycling programs. Like Nicole was saying, if you really wanna recycle and you have a, a container that has a clear label of, oh, this is recyclable and your town provides a bin to put it in, you're gonna be likely to put it in there. That's not what's happening now and we need to move towards, it should not be so difficult to recycle in the state of Maine. And it won't be if we can pass this policy. Okay, so I can say all that, but here are some actual data. Um, this is from um, uh, five provinces in Canada who have passed uh, EPR for recycling program. And I put this here to show, you know, it's not, this is a systemic change. Um, it doesn't change things necessarily overnight, but over time, recycling rates are shown to increase. Um, and, you know, as also as Nicole said, right now we're actually going backwards. So this is really puts us on um, a better path um, to success. And, you know, we can see recycling rates all over the world are, are, are double to what to the taxpayer funded systems under an EPR system. And um, yeah, also, you know, you do really get a better bang for your buck. The same, the same dollar goes uh, twice as far um, if you have an EPR system. Okay, here's just a couple quick packaging design change examples um, as a result of EPR system. In Belgium, um, you know, big company L'Oreal is producing refillable shampoo dispensers um, that, reduce, um, that reduce packaging. And in Italy, I really like this example. Those are actually curtain rod ends. <laughs> um, and uh, instead of wrapping those babies in plastic, this company has decided to switch to a 100% recycled content um, paperboard product um, they can fit 80% more onto their shipments, which has saved them money. Um, and they've also got down to a single material type. I don't, I, that's a really simple way to help recycling. If you don't have a package that's made up of all different kinds of material, that's, that's difficult to separate. So these are just a couple examples um, to see. Okay, so um, the, this switch in funding isn't just to cover the existing programs and um, all the costs uh, of, of what we already have now. It's really intended to increase our overall infrastructure in the state. And the funds raised for this um, would be directly related to the amount of wasteful packaging. So let's say if you're making a really wasteful package as a producer, as no markets, not recyclable, um, you're gonna have to pay a premium for that wasteful packaging. And that premium will be used to help um, increase um, education infrastructure. And that could be, let's say, um, could be uh, providing carts to municipalities. It could be um, putting in a new piece of equipment at the, uh, the recycling um, facility that helps with sortation, you name it. So these funds would be available, uh, not just to municipalities in Maine, but to whoever wanted to apply. Um, and the DEP would be um, overseeing those funds and how and uh, be able to distribute those in a way that they think would really um, enhance the infrastructure in Maine. Okay, so um, it's really important to have EPR program goals. And these goals, since it's a shared system, need to be fair. We can't give, say, the producers a goal for something that they really don't have control over and same for municipalities. Um, and these goals will really be used to inform the whole system. 
how the fees are set, uh, how to invest in the education infrastructure to reach these goals. Um, and the, the, there'll be specific goals for producers that include packaging reduction, reuse, and use of increased uh, uh, post-consumer -re recycled content in your packaging. That's stuff that they totally have control over doing. There'll be goals for municipalities to increase access and collection and participation because they're the ones who are really close to the, the people in their towns and they have, they have the best position to um, increase um, access and participation. And then there's overall program goals. Um, we want to uh, obviously collect as much as possible, um, the recycling. And we wanna know how much of that material is actually recycled. So those are two different numbers. And right now, our recycling rate, that 36% that um, Representative Krahowski mentioned, that's, uh, that's really the collection rate. We don't quite follow it through to know what's actually being recycled right now. But in this legislation, um, we'd like to get a little finer point on that. And you're seeing this happen all over the, the, the world. The EU is working on getting actual recycling rates, which is going to make it look worse. We're going to be looking like we're doing a worse job. But I think we need to know what we're doing so that we can actually um, move forward. And there's also um, litter reduction uh, goals for this as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here. So as a huge nerd, I am so excited about the data that we can collect from this type of policy. Um, you cannot manage what you can't measure. And, um, you know, right, you know, with this type of policy, we'll actually know the amount and the type of packaging that's sold into our state each year. Right now, we have no idea. Um, we will know, uh, have a better idea at least of if that material was collected and in fact recycled. Um, and one of, one of my favorite parts about this is that we'd have regular waste audits. Right now, um, you know, I talk about waste all the time and I rely on a um, really good um, but outdated waste audit um, done by uh, University of Maine students in 2011 to tell people what's in our waste stream. Um, we need regular audits of what's in our waste stream, what's in our recycling stream, what's contaminating the recycling stream, and um, more uh, information about our litter out in our environment, what that's made out of, um, who's making that litter, um, and how, that, that's how we can best um, tackle, uh, tackle these issues, is to, to get the information we need to continuously improve the EPR system or pass other laws um, based on the data that we're going to be collecting uh, through uh, through EPR. Okay, so we're I'm going to bring it in here in just a minute, and we're going to I'm really excited to talk to everybody and answer questions and hear your comments. But um, Representative and I thought we would get two frequently asked questions out of the way just right up front. So the first question I always get is, "All right, so if producers are inter internalizing costs. Are the costs of goods going to go up in Maine?" And I've uh, searched high and low and talked to a lot of experts and people in other places around the world. And um, I just, that's intuitive that that would happen, but I haven't seen any evidence of that happening after an EPR program is passed. And I'll explain, I think, why that is. Um, you know, for instance, well, we, we talked to uh, some people in the province of Nova Scotia. They do not have an EPR program there. They would like one. And they've compared prices of products in Nova Scotia to other provinces in Canada who do have EPR and they're not finding any difference in the price of those of those products. If anything, it seems to be, um, if there is a difference, it's more uh, um, transportation geography related um, <clears throat> changes in price. Um, we have an example here in the US with the bottle bill. I mean, there's 10 states with a bottle bill, Maine's one of them, but when you go, and it does cost producers money um, to, to manage that, that those systems, um, but when you look at the price of beverages across states, you're not finding that there's a, a higher price for beverages in beverage container redemption states. Um, I think another reason why this might be is that it really turns out to be fractions of a penny per container when you work the fees out. Um, and it's a very small uh, part of overall expenses for these uh, corporations. You know, we're already paying for all the, all the, you know, the prices are set um, to cover the costs of doing business. So we already pay for these companies um, salaries and utilities and um, advertising and lobbying expenses are all wrapped up in the price of the goods. And so this is just another one to internalize. Um, and I think price setting is more of a function, say, of geography and local economies and consumer behavior and price sensitivity. You know, people, uh, you know, businesses like to keep that 99 cents on the end there. They don't want to raise it to you know, the next, the next penny up. Um, but anyway, so I'm sure they are passed along somehow, but they're not in a noticeable way. And even if that is the case, I, I, 
I believe this is a much more fair and equitable way to keep this cost between the consumer of that product and the producer instead of externalizing it on a property taxpayer who has absolutely nothing to do with any of this. Okay. So next question we always get is, hey, those are all big like countries who have EPR, can Maine do this? And the answer is, heck yes, we can. And um, there's a lot of reasons why that is too. So uh, right now there are over, I think there's something like 120 EPR laws over 33 states and 14 product categories. Um, packaging EPR is not coming, um, it's not here yet, but it's coming. Um, and Maine already has eight other EPR laws um, that Representative Grahowski mentioned. And um, there's 10 other states that are pursuing EPR for packaging too. Um, and I will say actually, so with the, the EPR approach, it's actually a policy of our state to use EPR um, as a way to manage problematic materials. And um, every year our DEP puts out a product stewardship report where they, um, we have criteria for product categories to meet. And in the 2019 report, they have an excellent several pages of information um, relating to packaging and advocating really um, the data advocates for um, an EPR for, for packaging law. And um, I encourage I encourage you to, to read that if you're interested. Um, you know, since all these other states are considering EPR, you know, the dominoes are, are gonna fall. I don't, I don't wish for Maine to be the last one without an EPR um, for packaging system. And I say we embrace our, our dear ago motto and, um, and lead on this one. Um, New York might beat us, um, but we'll see. Um, okay, so I, um, yeah, really looking forward to the discussion. Please go to recyclingreform.org. It takes you to our page on NRCM's website where we have uh, fact sheets and more info on this. There's a petition for people to sign. Um, that's where municipal resolutions live and support and how you can do that. We also have a business sign on page for, for businesses to um, show their support in helping their communities manage all this packaging waste. Um, and contact me anytime. And I'm gonna hand it back off to Representative Brahowski to bring us in for a landing and give you a status. <laughs> on the day. Thank you, Sarah, for going through all those details. And I'm sure we'll have some detailed questions, but I just wanted to update everyone because this is another frequently asked question is, what's the bill number? When is it gonna be available? Um, we have uh, edited a first draft of the bill to make it better than ever. And it is back in the state house offices being finalized. So I do hope to have that LD or legislative document number that makes it easy to track legislation um, soon, but we don't have it yet. I'm very excited that Senator Rick Bennett is stepped up to co-sponsor and champion this and help uh, me and others with outreach to our colleagues. Um, there's just a lot of interested senators and representatives because they're hearing from you all that this is a problem and they too have their own waste in their homes they're trying to manage. So I think most people get it and hopefully we'll see this as the right solution. So I, I really think this is the year that we can reform recycling and we can lead and if we have to follow behind one or two other states, that's okay too. I think it's, uh, the U.S. is such an exciting place because the states are so different. We have different geographies, different, um, you know, types of people, leanings, et cetera, that we can all find solutions that fit for us. So I, I hope that this will be the year that we can do it. Um, and I think we're ready for questions. If we've got some from Kathleen. Thank you so much, Representative Grahowski. Sarah, you are uh, clearly experienced at doing this because you have already answered a couple of our most frequently <laughs> asked questions. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the, the down low on when we can expect the LD number. And, and for everybody who's on the line today, you know you can count on uh, on NRCM and MCV and, and lots of other good folks to, uh, to keep you updated on when that LD is out. Uh, just so you know, these links to the, the recyclingreform.org page and the petition that Sarah mentioned will be in the follow-up email that go out goes out later this afternoon. So um, if you're you're not don't have a pen handy, don't worry, we'll get those to you later today. Uh, you are also quite right, Representative, that we have a ton of good questions. So I'm gonna go right into those. Uh, and first, a quick clarification, the small business exemption that you mentioned, Sarah, that's for, for businesses with gross revenues under $2 million, right? 
Yes. Did I say that opposite? I didn't mean to. Check, yes. check the flag. Under. You, know, you said it correctly, oh, but. Yeah. That's so funny. I've been helping my six-year-old with his things. A and crocodile, I, right? I'm going to tell him that I got it wrong and he's going to, he's going to make him happy. I saw that and I was like. Thank you for that. <laughs> but teamwork. It's all uh, teamwork here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The legislation is drafted properly. I can ensure yes, that. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, it, it's really good to see that exemption because, you know, it would be awful if, if something like this were to exacerbate any kind of financial advantage that, that large companies have mm -hmm. over the smaller ones. Um, but that said, we want to see everybody transition to more recyclable and, and recycling ready packages. So would there be any incentives to help those small smaller companies make the transition? Um, well, I think uh, in other places uh, there's a lot of voluntary stewards, so they could actually choose to participate if they wanted to and get that support from the stewardship organization to, you know, I almost feel like it's a, like a free consulting service or included consulting service for these businesses who want to, who want to do that. And I think, um, yeah, and, and it's interesting even going through this, talking to some businesses, they don't, Right now, they didn't really know how much waste they were making. And in our discussions, they actually were forced to kind of go through and figure it out. And they were like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea I was putting this much packaging, you know, out into the world for, for leaving somebody else to clean up. So I think it's a really eye opening thing for businesses. That's really interesting. And, you know, I, you mentioned, Sarah, some of the, the alternative packaging that exists already. Mm -hmm. um, are there there kinds like corn-based plastic or, or one of our participants has heard about edible packaging. What do you like? What's, what are you most excited about and, and how can we help transition to those more quickly? Uh, is, is EPR the best tool or are there some other sort of stewardship opportunities? Um, I think that there's a lot of sister policies that would fit nicely into the system. This really is a systemic change, and I can tie pretty much everything to EPR at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, that's this would be if finally having a centralized organization whose responsibility it is to help people figure that stuff out. And I think as far as packaging goes, we need to obviously the less of it, the better. The more refill kind of opportunities we have, the better. But after that, we need to just make sure that our the materials we're using have the lowest impact um, and actually have a disposal kind of plan. So let's even that that counts for uh, compostable packaging too. I am not that excited about compostable packaging right now, and a lot of that is because it's just contaminating the waste stream. People get it because they oh they're great this is compostable but then they might, it might look like plastic and they throw it in their recycling bin and that really contaminates the recycling stream. So if we're gonna be using really any material, it just needs to have a collection bin in place and instructions on how to do that. It just, it's not rocket science, but we just need a coordinating body to help make those connections. So I think that's how it can address that kind of thing. And I would add, um, this is something I like to think about is once we have a system like this in place, if there are types of packaging that we want to incent producers to use, let's say here in Maine, we have a lot of um, wood products, wood fiber products, and a lot of innovation happening at the University of Maine system around that. We could say as part of those eco-modulated fees that you're going to pay less if you're using our locally produced uh, locally sourced uh, packaging materials that could be an outcome down the road as those materials come into play and it could help with uh, you know supporting the R&D for that so I think there's a lot of exciting places that this could go once um, it's underway and we have you know the numbers and the data that we need to and, and to know how to tweak those policies to get those other uh, effects that can ripple through the economy here. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So, so one way to think about this bill is to put the system in place so that we can sort of move the levers as we, we learn more and um, maybe as our goals change or, or evolve as new products are available. That's really interesting. Um, Sarah, I, I had a little flash of anxiety when you said people accidentally put the compostable plastic in with the recycling. And, and I think I'm not the only one because we had a couple of questions about uh, folks worried about what happens when the single sort, you know, how much of the single sort recycling ends up landfilled because it's it's contaminated with, with dirty stuff or, or non-recyclable stuff. Is it 
is it ever better to just process that as trash? Uh, particularly, we have a, a participant who lives in Auburn who has a, a waste where there's a waste to energy program. Is waste to energy better than landfill, or, or how do, how does yeah. a good want to want to be recycler know what to do? Right. So this is often a case of picking your least worst option. There's no best option. That's why it's best to just have less or refill and clean. But um, I feel like we need a better uh, management of the compostable kind of packaging in general. There's different, I mean, I just listened to a whole hour long presentation trying to decipher this the other day. You know, there's different compostable packaging that's made out of different materials. There's sometimes it can go to uh, like say an Exeter Agri Energy or it's, and it, but it's not good at your um, at home compost bin. It's just, there's not enough information out there and it's just kind of getting, um, getting out there. And, you know, EcoMaine, they've been um, really, like, really, really trying to educate their communities on this contamination issue. They've actually been forced to increase their, their prices to reflect contamination. They've had interns, they have educators. They're trying really, 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 really hard um, to do that. Uh, and that's wonderful, but we need to give them some help and get some um, just specific guidance from a, a governing body in that way that helps everybody know kind of the standards and then they'll do that and they don't have to kind of guess on their own and um, just kind of react to this onslaught of packaging that they're getting. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of wish cycling, I think it's called. Um, and we all feel that, you know, you've got this packaging and you're like, this seems like it should be useful again. It's so substantive that you want to put it in the bin or um, I think one of the challenges is if you're a person who moves between municipalities some, um, it can be a really different program and you've got to learn, oh, this one only takes, in Ellsworth we take number one, but it's only cylindrical products that are taller than they are wide. Now, <laughs> I don't know why there's a better market for that is for some reason, but this is really hard for people to understand because they think one is a one is a one. Um, so it, it's a, it puts a lot of burden on your just regular people to have to understand what is a really complex system. And so I hope that as we got more uh, money to help with education, but also to standardize systems to have people know I'm in Maine. These are the things I can recycle. Just like, you know, I'm in Maine. I can return my bottle for five cents wherever I am. Um, I think that would really help all of us who are don't follow and don't don't wish cycle. But <laughs> hopefully we can create a system where you don't have to even be tempted to do that because things are actually recyclable. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and while we're at it, can we get those numbers bigger? Because I, I keep saying I'm going to put a pair of readers right next to the recycling bill <laughs> or bin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other, the other change that I wonder about is um, how, how has COVID affected recycling? in Maine. I know in, in my town, we stopped accepting recyclables for the first few months of the pandemic. And, and I worried about whether people would get back into the habit once the program started up again. Has there been any tracking of that? Um, I've heard a little bit about that. I think at first there was like an increase. Um, I talked to EcoMaine about this a little bit too. And I think what they said is maybe there wasn't an overall um, change, but it was a shift. So there was a lot less business waste and a lot more residential waste, which is the stuff that municipalities are paying for. So in that way, it exacerbated the problem at home. Um, you know, a lot more you know, food packaging and people, you know, getting retail therapy deliveries to their home. Um, <laughs> I'm a little guilty of that myself. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's changed it um, a little bit. A couple of folks wondering if, uh, if there's an opportunity to address this on the, the federal level, you know, particularly given the um, really fabulous and ambitious policies that, that President Biden has introduced with the Build Back Better plans, that where do, is, is there recycling anywhere in, in that initiative or what do you think about that? Uh, yes, there's actually a Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that um, was just reintroduced um, uh, last week maybe before everything's a blur now, um, but recently. And um, as part of that bill, there is a, a national EPR for packaging um, proposals, national bottle bill, national plastic bag ban, national foam ban, a few other things in there. Um, I hope that some parts of that bill um, come to fruition. I um, am very positive, but I'm not gonna get my hopes up on that one. And um, I think that 
for to push this to the national level where I really hope it gets someday, we're going to need it's going to be the states going first. We have similar um, examples, say, even with the plastic uh, bag ban in Maine. We had enough enough towns doing it like just differently enough where it was just like, OK, <laughs> we need a standardized system for everybody to use. And um, that's what really tipped the scales um, for the statewide policy there. And I picture something similar happening um, happening here. Um, and we're not gonna we're not gonna get there until states do it. And that's part of the part of the reason I think that that mean, you know, we need to protect ourselves here and then help ourselves here. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see that help too. And I think before, I mean, I agree, I would love to see this be a national policy, but I think before that happens, it will be so important for the states to trial it and prove how it can work in really urban areas, really rural areas, mm -hmm. um, places where people have transportation or don't to uh, move the goods um, to the recycling facility or, or what have you. So I think we can do a lot of really important work sorting out some of those details so that if something were to launch nationally, it would work really smoothly right from day one. Right. And then, you know, there's a lot of different ways to set up an EPR program. Um, they're all, I think somebody asked a question, how is this similar to the other states? I do know that those are all reimbursement type models, but there's models where the producers just kind of take over everything and it almost creates this monopoly situation where they could hire one hauler to do everything, let's say. And it, to me, that's not as much of a just, a just transition. So that's another thing that would worry me about a, a national policy is I think we need to really carefully plan out the, the transition that we want to see and to, to yeah, learn in the States, like, like Representative said. Speaking of, of bills in different jurisdictions and at different levels, and there's also another bill very similar to this one before mm -hmm. the main legislature this year, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes, yes, there is. Um, this, there's another one, um, Bill Title put in, um, that is uh, being put forward by AmeriPen. It's a group of uh, producers, basically, you go to their website and see who's, who's part of that group. It's like Kellogg's, Procter & Gamble, Sunoco, Tyson Foods, there's a whole bunch of producers there. So they've, um, they've put in their own bill, and um, I'm just going to say I believe that this is a bad faith effort um, intended to uh, confuse and thwart progress here in Maine. I think that they see that we're boys to want to really do this. And um, part of the reason I think that's the case is that they they know that, say, I'm personally um, kind of quarterbacking this one and helping people. They won't, they won't talk to me or show me the bill I've asked and offered to, hey, can we work together to try to combine our ideas and come up with something? And um, they're like, oh, well, let's just wait until the bills come out. And um, they're meanwhile trying to go to all the supporters of this bill and try to tell them that they need to support theirs instead. So I haven't seen it yet, but I hear that it uh, leaves something, some things to be desired um, and it doesn't provide um, the, the necessary changes and benefits for municipalities that we really wanna see. And plus I, I believe it's probably gonna include a lot of exemptions for those big producers that we do not wanna see, which really undermines the, the program. But we'll see what happens there. They might have some good ideas, who knows. Yeah, and if there are good ideas, I, I think we're all open to them, of course, because I think that's the exciting part about the legislative process is you mm -hmm. see bills, you have public hearings, you get input, you keep refining things, and then you put a, a system into place and you continue to refine it. That's why we go back year after year. So mm -hmm. if there are any good ideas from anyone out there, mm -hmm. Amara Penn or any of you on here, we are open to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100%, 100% agree. So that's why I wish that they would have worked with me ahead of putting this bill in, but we'll have to do it well, at the committee. Thanks for, for starting to make sense of that. And, and I know that we can count on, on both of you for you know when both bills are out and we can, can look at them, that, that you two can help us sort of make sense of mm -hmm. the similarities and the differences and, and how a, a compromise bill that takes the best of, of mm -hmm. both um, mm -hmm. might come about. Is, is that bill, the, that alternative bill, the main sort of organized opposition perhaps, or, or who's behind the opposition in, in Maine? Um, well, it's hard, it's hard to say. You could, we could go and look at the, the testimony from 2104 last year, um, and you can see who was for and against that. I think a lot of the, I think there was a lot of misinformation spread around last year, and we've been really trying to work with businesses and people who are maybe confused by that uh, since then to let them know, um, you know, they're gonna oppose the law, could it please be based on actual facts. Um, so um, yeah, I think a lot of it's just a uh, yeah, resistance to change and um, uh, un uncertainty in how it's going to work. And um, yeah, so we'll yeah.
Let's see. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for, for helping to resolve a lot of that uncertainty for, for all of us on the call today. Uh, there were so many good questions. We never get to all of them, but today especially I'm feeling it because I, there are a lot I want to know the answers to too. Mm -hmm. So uh, to everyone on the line, we will we'll share those links to uh, recyclingreform.org and the petition and uh, a fact sheet and, and ways for you to find out more about this bill. And we know we'll be able to count on our our good friends to keep us informed as, uh, as the process moves along. So thank you, Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, we'll be back in this space next week with a really special conversation um, with speakers from this year's Justice for Women series. Uh, the Justice for Women series is organized by Kathy Wee of Wee International, and it brings distinguished speakers to Maine to present public lectures and to contribute to a global conversation about justice for women and girls in the developing world and in Maine. We are delighted to be collaborating with Kathy and the Justice for Women program to explore the impact of climate change on indigenous women around the world. I hope you'll join us next week. Till then, thank you all and have a beautiful weekend. Thank you.